Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Multi-Tissue Experiments in a Scalable and Automation-Compatible mm -hmm. Format. It is presented by Olivier Frey, PhD, who leads the Technology and Platforms Group at Insphero in Switzerland. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the <clears> drop-down <throat> box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen. Or use the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Frey. I will now turn the presentation over to him. So, hello everyone. Um, thanks a lot, Judy, for uh, this introduction and to LabRoots, uh, giving the possibility to present some of our latest developments that we are currently doing in a collaborative effort together with ETH Zurich, uh, Alin Sferro. Um, I would like to start to just give you a brief uh, numbers on, on Insfero, what we are doing. So we are specialized um, in producing and engineering 3D micro tissues. We're producing um, over 20 tissues, 20,000 tissues per month um, of a large variety of different um, cell types. And we are doing this um, for industrial clients so that they can test their substances on a 3D physiological model uh, in partnerships um, over publicly funded projects and academic partnerships, et cetera. So we have a large um, customer basis and have around uh, 50 employees at three different sites uh, worldwide. So the general platform, the 3D inside platform that we are producing is on one hand, has the goal to create a relevance between the in vitro assay and being able to extrapolate these um, data to an in vivo response. Uh, we do that in a most convenient way so that the customer um, has the available technology and handling um, platforms so that it can fully capitalize from the 3D cell nature that we are providing. And the whole platform that we have spans over the whole drug discovery process from um, high throughput technologies using 384 well plates or 96 well plates up to very complex um, three-dimensional multi-tissue system in a microfluidic environment. So I would like to first start um, with one of the models, which is our liver microtissues. These um, liver microtissues actually have a complex structures which allows all integrated biology in an intact metabolism, um, has mitochondrial activity, bile acid secretion, and um, is responsive to inflammatory stimuli. So we use actually this 3D tissue uh, model in a recent study. So we assessed it together with AstraZeneca, Genetech, um, to test its utility for um, clinical drug-induced liver inju injury, so-called um, DILI. And what we wanted to do actually is to see how does it perform compared to two-dimensional um, primary hepatocyte cultures um, and what you can see here is a graph actually of in the x-axis a large variety of known um, DILI compounds, so-called drug-induced liver injury compounds. And you see the circles are actually the 2D and primary hepatocyte cultures and the filled dots are the human liver microtissue data. So it's always the IC50 value that is highlighted here. And what you can see is, and what is um, very interesting, is that if you use a 3D culture, you for a large variety of so-called 
induced uh, drug induced livery compounds you see that you have a sensitivity which is much higher than if you just would use a 2d culture so the circles dot on the top that are still and not not detected which are on the upper of the of the graph show that with a 2d culture the ic50 value is not detectable whereas using a 3d culture it is detectable so we have a much greater sensitivity using um, 3d human liver micro tissue compared with standard culture. This is just a summary table of a couple of com um, compounds that actually were not able to be detected as daily positive um, that is highlighted in red, where it is actually that are um, daily positive and you could actually detect them using um, the 3D model. An important fact is actually also if you compare here in 2D graphs, also on the left side, the 2D, and on the right side, um, the 3D, is actually that you are even able to discriminate um, between compound um, that have uh, that are basically addressing the same function. So you can highlight, for example, of an endothelial receptor antagonist in the primary hepatocyte in 2D, you're not able to at all detect these, um, these toxic compounds, whereas with the human liver microtissues, you're able to discriminate um, different daily compounds, even though they are um, addressing um, the same mechanistic um, toxicity. An important um, other, um, just um, uh, an important um, other aspect is actually now. Now, now we had, uh, we were just addressing a healthy uh, micro tissue model, but we can push these three D tissue micro tissues also into disease model, as for example a liver fibrosis model. So what we do here is we use. Um, this just validated um, 3D micro tissue, and we add selected human stellate cells. And with the more complex model, which is now not just a co culture, but a triple or even a quadruple culture, we are able now to reflect some uh, or some of the fibrotic um, mechanisms that are happening, happening also kind of in fibrosis. And this is basically the pipeline. And um, so we use. What you can do with this model is um, you can, on the one hand, stimulate the disease. So you have the quadruple culture and using specific stimuli, such as uh, fibrosis inducing compounds or GGF beta, um, you can create the fibrosis model that you can see here in the center using this uh, quadruple culture. And from that point of view, and you can also inhibit uh, the disease using an uh, anti fibrotic marker. Um, and to inhibit actually the progression of fibrosis. And you can use this 3D micro tissue model um, and going into a lot of throughput co compatible endpoints on the right side, which are biochemical assay, gene expression, histology, and, and, and high content analysis. So here are a couple of graphs actually that shows that you are able uh, to induce um, the fibrotic disease state by, for example, um, an activated stellate marker um, that is increasing, or the mRNA MLR increasing by increasing actually the stimuli of TGF beta um, over several days. So we can see here that that's day seven, um, this um, probe and this activated stellate market is highly expressed at, at high concentration of, of TGF beta. Um, the same for collagen and um, type one marker um, that is actually produced by the activated stellate cells that are in the hepatic culture. Also here, we have a dose response due to the increase of the concentration of, um, of TGF beta. Further, we also um, see that um, of, of other fibrotic markers um, at, at day seven of treatment. Um, so stellate activity and um, early fibrosis activity and also different extracellular cellular matrix protein. I'm going pretty quickly over um, these, um, um, these, different, these different markers. Actually, the main message here should be that we cannot only produce like a 3D cell, a healthy 3D liver micro tissue structure, but we can also drive them into different disease model, which opens the spectrum of analyzing healthy or diseased liver tissues. Here are just a couple of pictures actually that show um, histological sections actually of the, of the fibrotic 
um, tissues where you see the DARP staining um, on the left side of a control, nearly no collagen expression. Um, whereas if we stimulate this with TGF beta, you see a large um, collagen expression inside the micro tissue distributed quite homogeneously through um, the whole and uh, the whole micro tissue. Another model that um, I want to quickly emphasize here are so-called is the pancreatic model that we have um, a 3D um, islet uh, micro tissues and the islets, the islet of Langerhans are actually inside um, the pancreas uh, of the human body. Um, they look like this um, and with the different um, sizes. So here you see uh, one of these islets that are incorporated actually in the pancreas and they include a lot of different cells. So beta cells, alpha cells, delta cells that are visualized here um, with the different colors. Um, these different cell types are interacting highly with each other and create the response that we actually experience in the human body if you're for example eating and you have a higher glucose concentration or the glucose concentration that is increasing in your human body and as a result you then have um, the secretion of insulin by for example the beta cells so an important fact here is that this communication between the different cell times is only working in 3D, as you can see here in the graph. So insulin secretion is highly stimulated in the 3D version, whereas if you would culture these, micro uh, these cells in a 2D layer, they cannot properly communicate with each other and you don't have the response that you would actually expect. So islet micro tissues or islets only function in 3D, there is no 2D alternative. And um, the problem is, if you look at primary islets and um, for in vitro testing, you have some limitations. One of them is you have a large variation inside, as you can see here in um, this section through, um, through the pancreas. So they have different sizes, um, they are very heterogeneous, you some have a complete different a ratio of cells that are incorporated. You have also variable pur purity, um, you have cell types that are actually not contributing to the response of the islets, and which makes it very difficult <clears throat> to be used as a tool for drug discovery because you need to handpick them so that you have a certain amount of um, comparable study. And, and finally, you have a very short um, viability in culture, just around three to four days, which is reducing actually your window of, of uh, your experimental window. So what we optimized here is actually what we are doing is we use, we taking the human pancreas, we isolate the human islets, we dissociate them into single cell suspension, and then we recreate or re-aggregate them into so-called human islet micro tissues that have, that are cultured in a 96 well plate and can um, be, um, be addressed or handled uh, using standard uh, pipetting tools in a very reproducible and reliable way. An important fact is that if we re-aggregate these human islet micro tissues, they have the same composition as in the human islet. So on the left side here, you see actually um, the composition of the aggregation on the right side as comparison as um, they are um, observed uh, in the human body. And what you can see is with, with human islets is actually that they have an increased response due to, incre uh, to uh, of insulin secretion due to increased glucose secretion. And this is also what you can, uh, what you can see here on the graph. Uh, the same is actually happening in our micro tissues. So with increasing concentration of glucose, we have an increased secretion uh, of insulin. So a very um, physiological response. The insulin content in the micro tissues is constant um, over this time and also um, the ATP is very constant. Most important is that this function is maintained over at least 28 days. So your experimental window is increasing substantially compared to native islets. So the islet size stay constant, ATP content stays constant, and at the bottom, most important, your response to glucose is the same independent of the day of culture. So at day seven you have, or at day 28, you still have the same response to the tracer. 
So these are a couple of uh, two examples of micro tissues that we were able to produce in a highly reproducible way um, on 96 or 384 well platforms um, for, for screening applications. So the 3D micro tissue has a large advantage. So you have a technology, or I just showed that you have a technology that allows you to produce a lot of different organ models using the same uh, manufacturing technology. And in our hands, we currently have brain micro tissues, liver micro tissues, the pancreatic micro tissues that I just presented you, tumor micro tissues, our skin micro tissues are available, and also the heart. Further, we can advance them into different um, in different disease models, so fibrosis, steatosis. There are also um, different species that are available, so human, monkey, dog, and rat for the liver micro tissues. And we can also increase in complexity, so for tumor micro tissues going from cell lines over um, PBMC inactivations or co cultures and to primary derived xenografts that actually come directly from the patients. So these micro tissues, as I said, are produced very reproducibly on demand in a scalable format. And here, for example, a picture of a 384 well plate with 384 identical micro tissues. And they are basically placed inside a box and shipped directly to the customer. So this is, um, this is the basic actually for the multi-tissue systems that I would like to uh, present you now. So multi-tissue systems have one uh, one of the major goals of multi-tissue systems is actually trying to em em emulate systemic interaction of compounds in the human body. Um, if you just look at a single cell type or one microtissue in a well, you actually are addressing um, an isolated pathway, let's say. And, and if you want to look at interaction between different organs, these interactions only become available in the animal. So the goal of this multi-tissue experiment is actually to look at interactions um, on in already the in vitro format in the preclinical testing. So here is just a very um, schematic view. So you have a couple of compartments uh, in which you have the culture of specific organ model. They are interconnected in a physiological way and there is media that is circulated between the different organ models. Yeah, maybe have some infusion ports that allow you to address, uh, to include um, some, some compound sampling ports for analysis, a pump that circulates the medium in between um, the, different, uh, the different models. So we can actually now incorporate directly our micro tissues inside uh, such a model because we have them um, already available. And this allows us um, basically um, to create such kind of a, a multi-tissue system. And what we need now is um, we need a microfluidic system or a circulatory system that allows us to intercorrect, interconnect these different organ models and um, to create such kind of a multi-tissue uh, multi tissue system. And this ends up in actually marrying two different uh, technologies. On the one hand, it's the 3D culture, so a physiological cell model on the left side, um, and microfluidic technology on the right side. And both of these technologies have a lot of different variations, and it is basically key to have on the one hand the 3D technology that is fully functional in a microfluidic technology, and on the other hand, having the micro technology engineered in a way that is fully compatible with CD cell cultures and maintains the viability the functionality over time when they are interconnected um, with each other. Another important aspect here is, is timing. And what I mean with timing is if you create well, let's say 3D cell culture models are already pretty complex by themselves. So they need to be created, they need to mature, and they need to be cultured in a way that they stay functional over time. So now you want to connect them with each other in a microfluidic system that itself can be complicated uh, using different pumps and using the setup and so, and so on. But what you also need to address is actually the kind of the supply chain management. You need to ensure that when you connect different micro tissues with each other, and you create the multi-tissue system, that all of these single components is actually available on demand, and at the same time is functional and viable um, when you start the experiment. 
So different micro tissues can have different maturation time. They need to be cultured in different medium. They need to be produced in different medium. And then you need to time that in a way that at day zero, they're actually functional. You can transfer them into the system or they are ready to use. And then you can start your multi-tissue experiment. And this is something what we addressed with the following approach. So we are using our already reliable and standardized off-chip microtissue production that is done using the hang and drop method. Um, and we are able using the technology of microtissues to do that on demand um, in a QC manner. So we can first QC the microtissues so um, that's we are ensure the functionality, and then we are transferring them into a microfluidic system where they are cultured inside a microfluidic channel, um, um, and that they are interconnected with each other. Um, and there, they experience like, kind of higher in vivo like conditions, so higher cell to liquid ratios. There is a better liquid turnover by the convection through flow, and they are experiencing dynamic mechanical uh, forces. And the chip that we actually did for that um, is something that I want to present now in a little bit of more detail. So it's a polystyrene chip um, that you can see here on the top, um, which is actually part um, of a frame where it is integrated and where um, the different compartments are actually within the SPS standard plate format. <clears throat> so this is a system that is fully compatible um, um, with automation. Um, the chip, having a little bit closer look at it um, and looking at the cross section, has two channels. So there are two channels on each chip and one channel cross section looks at, as you can see it here. It on the left and the right side has a liquid reservoir. And in between, there is a small microfluidic channel that is interconnecting 10 micro tissue compartments. And these micro tissue compartments um, can talk uh, with each other. The microtissue compartment is engineered for the microtissues, which means that it is made that microtissues can be cultured optimally in, they can be loaded and removed in a very um, simple way. You can see here the microtissue compartment, it has such kind of a funnel-like structure and has a rim on the top. And the microtissue just holds around one microliter of volume and is top open. So we call that so-called standing drop port. So we leave that standing drop port actually open over the duration of the whole experiment. This allows us having a minimal dead volume <clears throat> and another couple of, um, of additional features. One of them is we have optical access from the top and of the bottom. So lights can easily penetrate and we can have an optical access using an inverted microscope. Further, we have a direct and local oxygen supply through the liquid air interface at the virginity of, of the, of the micro tissue, which to some extent can be sometimes pro problematic if you don't have a permeable uh, microfluidic chip. Further, it allows us to do a so-called contact transfer. So the micro tissue is, um, can be addressed from the top directly for loading the micro tissue into compartment and to remove the micro tissue after an experiment and for downstream analysis. And finally, the liquid air interface is basically a dynamic membrane, which um, allows us to go up and down and create an integrated pump so that medium can be exchanged efficiently in that small dead volume that this compartment is creating. So what we actually did with that microfluidic chip we sh is we simplified from the circulary system that you can see that I presented at the beginning very schematically into a linear version. So we now have different micro tissues that can be aligned in a line. And one of the most important um, features out of it is due to miniaturization that we do, we can now parallelize these micro tissue systems or micro tissue experiments in a very reproducible way. So the flow is actually generated using tilting of uh, this chip. So we have reservoir on each side of this, micro uh, of the, of this chip. And by tilting um, the microfluidic chip back and forth, we create a hydrostatic um, pressure between the upper reservoir and the lower reservoir. And this hydrostatic pressure is generating a flow from the top reservoir to the lower reservoir and interconnects using flow the different micro tissue compartments. 
We don't need any tubing for, um, for this actuation of flow. And the chip is basically, or the system is kept as, um, as simple as possible. And for scaling, we can just use um, a multiple of these plates. We can stack them above each other onto such a tilting platform that then is placed directly inside, um, inside an incubator. Um, so this technology now allows us a high and a lot, um, a lot of flexibility um, with respect um, to preclinical applications that we can arrange. So you can actually literally load whatever micro tissue into one or multiple of these 10 compartments inside this linear channel. So, and this allows us to do a lot of different combinations and a lot of different um, preclinical multi-tissue um, configurations um, and, and applications. But one important step now is to incorporate the micro tissues um, inside um, um, into, um, into the chip. So due to the fact that our concepts relies on this transfer, we need to ensure that this transfer is done in a reproducible and in a highly efficient way. And this is actually what we engineered here. So what you can see here, for example, is on the left side, you see um, a couple of production plates of liver and tumor micro tissues. And what we can use now is an automated setup where we can pick up the micro tissues with a pipette or a multi-channel pipette directly out of the production plate we run over to the microfluidic um, plate. We do a contact transfer and the micro tissue is directly um, included into the, um, into the microfluidic compartment in a parallel and very automated way. And what you will see now um, on the next slide is actually um, a small video which shows this using a 90, 90, um, 90 channel um, wellhead and allows to do the parallel transfer from the trap plate um, into the microfluidic chip. So what you have seen is that the micro tissues have been picked up, 20 in parallel. You could nicely see how the micro tissue is sedimenting inside the chip, inside um, the tip towards the bottom of the liquid air interface. And then you just need a small contact with the microfluidic compartment and the micro tissue is directly transferred in to the compartment and then can be used um, for imaging, uh, for, for, for cultivation. Um, we can even push that toward full automation, which means that we can let an automated robot to do the loading. And what you can actually see in the next is an automated pick and place assembly. So we have two production plates. Um, one is eyelid micro tissue and one is liver micro tissue and a robotic transfer that fills up a complete um, microfluidic chip within five minutes. So once the micro plate, the microfluidic plate is loaded, it is sealed using a foil and then goes on top of this tilter um, inside the incubator. And from this time point on can be handled as a standard micro plate. You can remove it for analysis, optical analysis. You can exchange the medium. You can um, remove samples for downstream analysis. And at the end of the experiment, you can, you, you can remove the micro tissues and do analysis on the micro tissues themselves.
So what we now I want to quickly go into it is a couple of uh, different applications um, that we are currently working on. And um, one of them is we load actually the chip only um, with liver micro tissues, which allows us to address the MPK questions and increase the cell to liquid ratio. I would like to go into an applications on the oncology side um, where we combine tumor and liver micro tissues. And first, um, first uh, results that we did in the metabolic disease range where we combine actually pancreatic islets uh, with liver micro tissues inside the microfluidic chips. Further applications are in the direction of metabolic competence. If you look at the toxicity of compounds that first need to be metabolized or have side effects due to metabolization on the heart and on the skin. And there you can easily combine liver micro tissues with heart or skin micro tissues. So one of the first application is actually the MPK. So one of the important questions in the MPK department is the clearance of compounds, which means that every compound has a pharmacokinetic um, concentration curve that you see actually here on the right side. So a compound is increasing in concentration after uptake, goes in the into the therapeutic range over a certain time, and then it decreases, the concentration decreases in the human body down to zero again. And this decrease is the so-called clearance out of the human body. And this clearance is a very important parameter to define the dosage of a compound and the concentrations that can be taken. And this clearance is actually done extra, um, is investigated in vitro by just um, by just incubating the compound together with the hepatic model, which can be primary hepatocyte suspension, plated cells. And what you look at is at the concentration of the parent compound that is depleting over time. This gives you an idea on how the clearance will be um, in the human body. The problem here is now that. Currently, pharmaceutical companies are tending towards compounds that are much more stable, which means that they are, they are, the clearance is very low and they are much more stable in the human body, which means that you can do less dosage, one pill per week, et cetera. The problem is now if you use these in vitro models um, with these compounds uh, and, and you have hepatocyte cultures that are very short-lived, in this limited amount of time, you're not able to see any clearance, which makes it very difficult to predict the clearance actually in the human body. And the idea here is actually to use the micro tissues, which are much more physiological, and they, have mo they are much more time stable. And what we have is a much higher cell to liquid ratio. And um, the SIP activity is much higher. Uh, and uh, further, we can actually improve the SIP activity or the metabolizing capacity of these micro tissues in the microfluidic system, as you can see on the right curve, and um, where we see that the SIP activity, which is um, um, which is actually the reason of the clearance of specific compounds is much higher if you culture it in a microfluidic environment compared to the static. So we can actually combine the 3D culture, increasing the cell to liquid ratio and even increasing the metabolic function of, um, of the liver uh, micro tissues so that we are able to better clear or to better predict such kind of low clearance compounds. And this is something what you can see here. So these are three compounds, quinidine, tolutamide, and warfarin, which are very low clearance compounds that usually have very difficulties to be predicted in in vitro assays. And what you can see here, these first results show that using the system, so having multiple micro tissues in a very small uh, volume, we are able to actually see a clearance down to 37, 23, and, and 13%. And with these values now, you have actually the capability to, to predict <coughs> the clearance of these compounds um, in vivo. Another application that I want to go into is the so-called hepatic prodrug activation. So here, it's kind of an oncology applications where we are combining tumor micro tissues with liver micro tissues. The reason why we are doing that is actually that there are so-called prodrugs, as for example, cyclophosphamide, that first needs to be metabolized by the liver before they are actually active in the human body. 
and are able to attack or basically have an effect on a specific cancer. So ciclophosphamide is actually transformed into four hydroxyphosphamide, um, which is spontaneously transferred <clears throat> into um, other phos um, phosphamide and, and which then has an effect on cancer. And this is something that we actually could reproduce in the microfluidic system. But what we first did <coughs> is we actually tested what is the effect of cyclophosphamide directly on the tumor. And what you can see here on the two graphs is on the left side is where we looked at it in the static. So we just had tumor microtissue in a well plate and we looked at the growth of the microtissue in the presence and the absence of cyclophosphamide, where you can actually see that there is not a lot of difference. And also in the microfluidic system where we had three different concentrations, 0, 0 0.1 and 1 millimolar of cyclophosphamide. And where you can see on the right side very significantly the growth of the microtissue tumor um, from day zero to um, day eight. So in all of these um, concentrations, there was an unhindered growth of, of the tumor microtissue. So what we then did is we added the liver, which is actually metabolizing cyclophosphamide. And then interestingly, what we did did in the static version, where we first pre-incubated the cyclophosphamide um, here on the left side, <clears throat> together and with the liver and then transferred it into the tumor, we did not see any effects, even though we had quite a high concentration of cyclophosphamide. But if we did a direct connection between the liver microtissue and the tumor microtissue inside the flow system, we actually could see at one millimolar of concentration that the tumor ceased um, to grow. So there is a cytostatic effect if we culture or co-culture liver and tumor in the presence of one millimolar of cyclophosphamide, which is also very visible on the pictures on the right side, where you can see that the very right bottom image, a uh, much smaller microtissue, a much less grow of, of the tumor microtissue. This indicates basically that for very unstable metabolite, as for example, for hydroxycyclophosphamide, it is important to co-culture the two different um, tissue models side by side. And we could also actually measure the different metabolites. So what you can see here with only tumor, you can only see the parent compound on the left side and using mass spectroscopy. But if you actually have the liver in the system, we see the appearance of the different um, metabolites that have been measured using um, mass spectroscopy analysis. Another quick experiment that we did <coughs> is um, compound inactivation. For example, there is <coughs> terfenidine, which is actually um, a terfenidine is also a so-called um, drug um, that first um, needs to be metabolized by the liver into fexofenadine, which is, has then um, an antihistamic component. And importantly, terfenadine has been removed from the market because itself has um, a toxic effect on heart. And so the liver is actually detoxifying terfenadine. And this is something what we wanted to, to, to test. And we did this in actually in a chip um, that we constructed prior to the one that just presented, but just as proof of concept, you can see here on the top the different graphs. So if you don't have any liver microtissue inside the system and just the heart microtissues, you see the beating is stopping already after day two in the presence of terfenidine. But if you basically, this is, these are the green dots actually. But if you have the liver present, what we see actually that the beating is maintained. So you still have beating at day two and day four, which means that terfenidine is very quickly transformed into fexofenadine, which itself then has much less toxic effect on, on the heart. If we use an inhibitor, we again see the cytotoxic effect um, of, or the functional effect of um, terfenidine on the heart on the very right uh, curve here as well. And um, then finally, a uh, couple of insight into first um, co-cultures that we did um, combining the islet microtissue um, together with the liver microtissue. So first of all, what we saw is that if you culture the islet microtissue in a microfluidic environment, um, the response and the functionality is increased. 
So here in purple, you actually see a standard culture, um, a so-called glucose stimulated insulin secretion assay, and always two bars. So the small bar is at very low glucose and the large bar is at high glucose. And the difference, having a large difference um, is a good indicator of proper functionality of the microtissue. And secretion rates having two, five, or even 10 microtissues inside the microfluidic compartment um, is nearly doubled. Undependent of how much microtissues we have in, in the microfluidic um, system. So we can culture up to 10 microtissues in the same volume, a liquid volume, without decreasing um, the functionality of the single microtissues. Further, what we see if you look at chronic insulin secretion is that the chronic insulin secretion is much lower, which gives us an indication that the islets are less stressed when they are cultivated on the flow. We also did some first co-culturing experiment um, that you can see here. We looked at ATP. Um, sorry for that. Uh, we looked at, at ATP, um, and we actually don't see a difference um, between um, if we co-culture the microtissues with each other um, as in we would have cultured them uh, alone without the other microtissues. Interestingly, on the functional side is that if we culture the liver microtissues together with the islet microtissues, is that the albumin secretion, which is a functional marker for a liver, is maintained at high concentrations. So this is something that we are continuing now to investigate, especially over a longer period of time. Uh, important is also that we would like to study the glucose homeostasis, so how glucose is regulated by these two tissues. We can also add a metabolic sink, for example, fats or muscle microtissues, and also advancing um, the system into the disease states, such as replacing the islets uh, by diabetes type 1 and type 2 um, islet models, or, or also um, exchanging the liver microtissues by um, a steatotic uh, liver um, which, um, which has a much higher amounts of fat inside. So these are um, a couple of applications that I just wanted to highlight and which gives you actually an insight on the flexibility and possibility of that microfluidic system. So it is very versatile and allows you to combine, combine a lot of different micro tissues inside the same system for a large variety of of preclinical efficacy and toxicity testing applications. And at the same time, the system, the flow is actually improving tissue specific in vitro functionality and does this um, not only in a very robust and a simple manner, but allows you to scale it. So due to the simplicity of the flow of the microfluidic setup, it allows you to, um, to experiment a lot of different applications and a lot of different replicates in parallel and therefore can be truly scaled um, for, um, in a reliable and, and robust manner. With this slide, I want to end and at the end want to acknowledge the different people that were involved in the development over the last couple of years. This is um, ETH with the bioengineering laboratory and um, Roche, um, also um, ETH at the BSCC, basically, then collaborators at, at ETH. There are a couple of funding agencies that were um, providing money so that these projects um, could, be, could be developed. I would also like to thank all of you for your attention. And if there are questions, I would, I'm happy to, to, to answer them. Thank you, Dr. Frey, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. So if you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for, so let's get started. Our first question is, what is the liquid volume in the microfluidic system? Yeah, so the liquid volume is actually deferring. It's, it can be um, depending on the application. Um, the system is laid out in a way that you can culture um, 50 to 100, 200 microliters of, of liquid um, in the medium and uh, together with one up to 10 microtissues. So you can vary the cell to liquid ratio in a, in a quite flexible way. 
Okay, your next one is, what is the medium available for each micro tissue in the system? Um, so, the medium is then, I mean, the, the medium is then basically depending on, on, on the different, um, uh, it's depending on the ratio. So if you have, for example, 10 micro tissues and 100 micro tissue of volume, um, you basically have just 10 microliter per micro tissue. But due to the fact that there is flow, all 10 micro tissues actually see the 100 microliter. So there is a much more efficient medium exchange um, inside um, inside the microfluidic system. The compartment itself just has a one microliter volume, but due to flow, this one microliter is continuously exchanged. Thank you. Next one is, different organ models need different medium composition. How do you account for that in multi-tissue <laughs> configuration? Mm. Yes, I mean, this is a very important question. So, um, especially for the production, um, the micro tissues might be very sensitive to what are the media compositions. But this is actually the reason why we completely decoupled the production um, from um, uh, the production from, from the culturing. So, the different micro tissues can actually be produced in their native medium and then can be acclimatized acclimated to um, a certain common medium. So the common medium is then a very important aspect and will differ from applications and what micro tissues are combined with each other. So every combination might need an optimization of the medium and the medium needs to have, the com have, needs to have components which are compatible with an application. So for example, for the clearance, applications that I just showed before, we want to have a medium that has a low protein content because compounds might absorb to the proteins. So this is also an engineering aspect, aspect that comes along with setting up and engineering multi-tissue systems. But due to the fact that we have a, a parallel system, we can test a lot of different media compositions so that we can optimize the different mediums towards um, the, the final application. Thank you. How can you simulate circular flow? So yes, this is a question that comes up often. Um, we, as you could see, we actually simplified um, the system in a way that we don't have a perfect circulation. Our circulation is basically going from um, bidirectional. So it goes from one reservoir to the other reservoir. But the simplification of the organ model itself, which is the micro tissue, um, makes um, this simplification very reasonable. Because a circulating flow only makes sense, actually, if a component is substantially transformed when it passes one time through an organ model. And this is due to the simplification of the system, anyways, not the case. So you're not able to reproduce a one passage through the, micro, um, through the organ model that we have it here. So the simplification of having a bidirectional flow um, is not that much of an issue in our system. However, due to the bidirectional flow, we have to some extent circulation in a way that we can simulate up concentration. So the same medium is cultured with the micro tissues over the defined number of time, which allows you actually to have an up concentration, for example, of metabolized toxic compound and so on. Well, I would like to once again thank Dr. Frey for his presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through August 31st, 2018. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That is all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.